All right, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for our special guest lecture with Professor Sergio Montero. My name is Linda Shai. It's my pleasure to be your host today for um, the colloquium lecture um, by Professor Montero. Before we get started, I'd like to ask Paula to give today's land acknowledgement. Um, Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayacono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayacono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayacono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayacono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Thank you so much, Paula. So today marks our extra special uh, special lecture here today outside the normal series. Um, and then uh, the following week, next Friday, at the usual time of 1225, we will have one additional lecture by Professor Gerald Ezel from Africana Studies. So for those of you who have missed certain lectures previously in the series, you're welcome to attend that one as well. Um, or I think in general, his talk will be extremely interesting on the Flint water crisis and issues of public health and the intersections with urban planning. So please join us then. Um, and that one I think will be an entirely virtual event. We'll probably be able to screen it here for those who need a space, um, but you can also watch from the comforts of your home. So today, thank you, a warm welcome to Professor Montero and to those of you in the audience in person here, as well as online. Professor Montero is Associate Professor of Urban and Regional Planning and Development at the University of the Andes in Bogota, Colombia. He is also Director of LABNA, an Urban Narratives Lab, and Associate Editor of the journal Regional Studies. His research is focused on the politics and governance of urban and regional planning, the global circulation of urban and regional policy models, and best practices, as well as institutional and territorial approaches to local economic development policy, with an emphasis on Latin American cities and peripheral regions. He has co-edited four books on local and regional economic development, as well as on the global circulation, mobility, and diffusion of urban policy knowledge. During the first semester of 2022, he has been a visiting professor at the University of Toronto's School for Cities, and he has a PhD in city and regional planning from UC Berkeley. Sergio, I know you wanted to be here with us in person today. I am, I, on behalf of the US, uh, United States of America. I apologize that our embassy denied you your visa so that you cannot be here in person, but I'm really delighted that you were able to join us virtually. Please take it away and join me in welcoming our guest. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Linda, for the introduction. And yes, I would have, uh, love to join you there today. Unfortunately, um, it was impossible due to a, a visa situation. But I'm very glad that uh, there was a possibility to do this talk uh, online. So uh, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. I also want to thank uh, Nima Kudba, even though I think she couldn't uh, join us today either because uh, she had to travel, but she was very kind, kindly organized my, my visit. Um, so thank you very much to everyone attending. And so I'm going to share the screen to show you um, some slides of the talk that I want to give today. I guess uh, you can see my screen. I will assume that you are. So, um, so the talk that I want to uh, give today is about my current research, uh, research that I've been doing since the last couple of years. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Linda said, I'm a professor at uh, Universidad de los Andes, which is a university in Bogota, Colombia. But this semester, I'm, do, I'm doing a visiting professorship uh, at the School of Cities in Toronto. So I'm not that far from Cornell. Um, so today, I will be talking uh, about two things that are very much related. One is a recent article that just came out uh, actually two weeks ago. Uh, it's called Mobilizing Legal Expertise in and Against Cities, Urban Planning and its Increased Legal Action in Bogota. So in that article, together with my colleagues, uh, Luisa Sotomayor from York University and Natalia Angel Cabo from the law school at the University of the Andes, 
we uh, uh, explore the increasing role of uh, legal action and legal expertise in urban planning projects in Bogota. So here is our first paper of this uh, collaborative research that we've uh, published. And so I think that I will talk for a little bit about this article because some of the things that we explore in this article is what I will later uh, develop in the second part of the talk where I will talk about the uh, a new book project that I'm writing on during my sabbatical here at Toronto uh, that combines some of these ideas on the increasing role of uh, legal expertise in planning and how that is changing and reconfiguring urban politics and participatory planning uh, in the city. So um, at the end, we'll have a space for uh, Q&A uh, so uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work, but I guess we'll have uh, space to both people that are participating through Zoom and those that are uh, in the auditorium. So um, yeah, so if you have questions, please please write them down, and I'll be. I'm also I have to say that uh, I'm in the process of writing in conceptualizing this book, so this is very helpful for me as it as I try to explain my ideas and especially if I uh, receive some feedback from you. So uh, it will be greatly appreciated. Uh, so, okay, so first I'll start with this article. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, as, I, as I say, it just came out two weeks ago and we we're very excited to see it published uh, because this is, uh, in this article, we tried to put some of these ideas of what is going on in Bogota uh, recently and how this is changing um, uh, urban politics and planning. Uh, so I'll start with this quote from Enrique Peñalosa. I don't know if you, some of you, probably know who he is, some of you probably don't, uh, but Enrique Peñalosa was the mayor of Bogota uh, in 1998 until 2001. And more recently, he has a second term uh, from 2016 until 2019. So this uh, newspaper interview in Colombia's uh, main newspaper, El Tiempo, he talks with uh, journalists doing sort of like a balance of his second term uh, as a mayor in Bogota. And that's, uh, that's what the newspaper chose to highlight from the interview, which says uh, in Spanish, más que los insultos me duele que los jueces paren las obras, which in English translate to more than insults, it hurts me that judges stop public works. So that to us was very significant, like how, like how after three years of mayor, this was one of the main things that was concerned uh, to him. And you might remember, and if you don't know who Enrique Peñalosa, you maybe uh, probably have heard, if you're, especially if you're planning students, uh, you probably have heard about Bogota's transmillennial BRT system. So uh, a BRT, as much of probably you know, it's a bus rapid transit system. It's, it's also known as a metro on surface. So basically, you have dedicated stations in the center of the road to uh, make um, going up in and out of the bus uh, more quick. So you have this system that was not invented in Bogota, it was actually the first city that did this system was Curitiba in Brazil in, uh, 70, in 1976. But Bogota uh, uh, built in 1999, built the biggest to date uh, BRT system in the world. And this was Enrique Peñalosa's uh, sort of legacy from his first term in as mayor of Bogota. So uh, in recent years, we've seen a, a boom of BRT systems around the world. And as I said, uh, Bogota is not the first city that did it, but it was sort of like the first city that did it at such a big scale so that it could compete with subway systems. So Bogota doesn't have a subway to the day. To the day. Bogota has 8 million people. So it's one of the few cities in the world with more than 5 million city, uh, people that doesn't have a subway system and that creates all kinds of nightmares, like, as you can imagine. But the interesting thing about this is that you can see how Enrique Peñalosa in his first term, he was very much a promoter of beer, of building a huge BRT system rather than investing in a metro line. And, and sort of like the rationale for this was, the, was that BRT is much cheaper and can move people uh, almost at a scale as, as a subway. So there's a lot of critique and I'm not gonna go into the you know, benefits or critiques of BRTs here because this is not the, the objective of the talk. But I wanna, what, what I wanna say here is that Bogota and particularly Enrique Peñalosa was very uh, much instrumental in the expansions of BRTs around the world. And I brought here some, ex some examples of cities 
that have built a BRT system uh, based or referencing Bogota's BRT. So for instance, Guangzhou in China was one of the first Chinese cities to build a BRT system. And it was, there's a lot of study tours uh, between Bogota and Guangzhou that happened uh, in order for this to happen. And then a lot of Chinese cities then replicated these ideas uh, from Guangzhou um, directly. Uh, Johannesburg in South Africa also uh, built a BRT. There's a, actually a new book that just came out from Astrid Wood, which is a South African uh, urban studies scholar who has traced how the ideas from Bogota arrived in South Africa, especially in the area of BRT and how South African cities built BRTs based on uh, Bogota's ideas. Um, Mexico City also built a, a BRT very much uh, based on, on Bogota's Transmillennial, Jakarta, in Indonesia, it's called Trans Jakarta, actually very similar. The stations are very similar too. And more recently, the San Francisco and California also built a BRT, which has been forever in the making. This was in the making when I was a PhD student at Berkeley back in 2010, but it's finally actually it was this month it was released. And some of the ideas of Bogota were also influential. So this is all to tell that in, this, in his second term, Enrique Peñalosa came to Bogota as mayor again and, and thought, okay, I'm going to, again, replicate this idea and I'm going to build a BRT, a new BRT line in Bogota's main avenue, which is called La Septima or the Seventh Avenue. And so, surprise, surprise, he couldn't do it this time because a judge stopped the project. So, and this is this judge stopped the project because there were at least six different legal demands from different politicians and group of concerned citizens that put together uh, a class action, different class actions. Uh, and, may, and finally, one of them was processed by a judge and stopped the project on the BRT project of Seventh Avenue, which was Peñalosa's uh, flagship project for his second term. So now this, I did, and I wanted, I wanted to start with this story because I think it is very telling about how such a big project, such a flagship project of this mayor that has been globally recognized was only be able to be stopped in Bogota by a judge, right? Because participatory planning meetings, even though there's a lot of people opposed to this project for, for reasons that I will tell more later, then couldn't really stop the project. The only person or the only way that this project could be stopped was through, it, through going through the courts. So this uh, made us very interested in what is going on then here. And here we have a graph of uh, class actions. Uh, class actions are judicial mechanisms that citizens can uh, put in the courts to protect collective rights. So you can have, for instance, put a class action against, actually one of the class actions against Transmillennial was that it was a polluting system because it was using diesel. So people prefer to have a metro system or an electric uh, light rail. So anyway, so there's all kind of collective rights that you can um, invoke in order to uh, question or stop a pro an urban planning project. But what's interesting here is that we see an increase in the cases of class actions against the Bogota's Urban Development Institute, which is the, an agency uh, in charge of building Bogota's infrastructure. Here we have uh, the kind of popular actions that have been filed by kind of by the topic of the claim. So we see there's a lot of judicial actions around roads, but also around sidewalks and public spaces and also about public uh, transport and also environmental issues is a big is a big thing. So here we in this article, we also give an estimate that uh, so that recently there was this report uh, by the Association of Colombian Cities that estimated that about 69,000 lawsuits there in 2009, they were currently, uh, they were at, in 2009, 69,000 lawsuits, lawsuits against Bogota's local government agencies and the economic claim surpass uh, the $5 billion. Uh, so we see this as a phenomenon that this report called it a phenomenon of dramatic dim dimensions and one that is not only draining resources from local governments, but also blocking important uh, urban planning projects for the city. So now we became 
more interested in then understanding. So what we do in that article is try to understand the scope of the phenomenon in Bogota, particularly in urban planning, because when we talk about lawsuits against local government, this could be also around other areas of, of local policy. So not necessarily urban planning, also, I don't know, education uh, policy, for instance. But we were, but we're more interested in understanding what is going on with planning and these legal actions and sort of like some of the consequences of this. And this is a sort of like an exploratory article. So the idea was to also propose, based on our initial findings, propose a future research agenda for urban and social legal scholars, which I think are perhaps more equipped than urban studies and urban planning to, uh, to help us understand what happens when the law and legal expertise become involved so uh, much in urban planning issues. So we wanted, to, we also want to create a collaboration or a collaborative debate between urban studies and um, social legal uh, scholars to try to understand what is going on and how this, what are the possibilities and limits to democratize urban planning when legal action or legal expertise is become involved. So that's some of the, um, goals of that article and I will briefly uh, tell you now some of the reasons we found that are behind the rise of Bogota's legal action uh, in urban planning. So one of it is the incentives to promote litigation to protect individual and collective socioeconomic rights. So one of the one of the most important things is that there was a change in constitution in Colombia in 1991. So the new constitution and this is this happened in many countries in Latin America, right? So the, the 80s and 90s happened in Brazil in 88, happened in Colombia in 1991. So there was a wave of democratization in Latin America in the 90s. Uh, that come also also in the 2000 many other countries such as Ecuador, Bolivia and Peru also had new constitutions and now we have actually a big debate about the new Chilean constitution that is being discussed. Um, so we have this wave of democratization in the in the 90s in, in Latin America so in Colombia this new constitution uh, actually is one of the most progressive constitutions in Latin America so it has it, it sought to provide easier access for citizens to the judiciary to protect individual rights and collective rights. So there's a sort of like new mechanisms that became more easy for citizens to use. One is a tutela. So it is a legal claim that an individual can claim, uh, can make a claim uh, to the government through the courts and acciones populares, which is the, which is the one we sort, it's sort of similar to class actions in the US, although there's also some differences but it's the one that have been more used uh, in order to block urban planning projects. So these, mechan these legal mechanisms were not used in urban planning, even though the, the constitution established them, uh, this was not really used in urban planning uh, until recently. So it was mostly used, especially in health issues. So especially for individual rights. So people without access to certain medicines, for instance, would like reclaim with a tutela to the national government for us to ask for their for the health rights and also environmental movements started to use it a lot so a lot we saw a lot of environmental uh, movements using acciones populares uh, to claim uh, for the collective rights to the environment and trying to stop particular projects especially extractive uh, economic activity in rural areas uh, some around rivers but not so much about urban planning the, also, the other thing that uh, this, this is important to, to say here is that there was an economic incentive in the beginning so that citizens would like, so that the state would encourage for citizens to claim if they see uh, that the, their collective rights were in danger. Although at some point it became like so many collective actions that the state had to eliminate the economic incentive. So there was this economic incentive that was going on from 1998 until 2012. But then what we see and what we argue in this uh, article is that we see an increase in legal action in urban planning specifically since around 2014-15. And now there's a high uh, rate, uh, high success rate in lawsuits against lo local governments because many people have learned how to do that. So what we see here is a learning curve, right? So that didn't happen immediately even though the legal framework changed but it took a while for people to really understand how powerful were these instruments. So um, the second uh, reason we see behind this rise was 
political motivation. So we saw, what we also saw in our interviews that we did for this project is a lot of local elected politicians, council members, using legal actions, using tutelas, using acciones populares to oppose the, whatever current mayor was in power, to block flagship projects in a way to, um, to discredit the current local government. So this also, this mobilizing the law and putting projects in courts also became uh, a political platform for many of them. So some of them became uh, recognized for having blocked a particular project, right? So that we also see this motivation of how uh, legal mechanisms are increasingly used by all political parties, but especially we saw that they use them on parties on the left in Bogota. Uh, and these we still don't have a, we don't have a clear explanation of why this is. This is an area that we're exploring, but we sort of like imagine that this is linked with how uh, parties on the left and, le and leftist activists have been, are, are used and familiar with the use of legal mobilization, the use of uh, mobilizing the law to reclaim housing or environmental um, uh, uh, causes. So um, the other, um, the third reason we saw behind this rise was a perceived lack and failure of participatory planning. So what, what the constitution, the new constitution did in Colombia in 1991, and then lately the law that that's sort, of, sort of like the legal framework for urban planning in Colombia, which is called the Law 388 of 1997, um, created uh, a mandatory um, aspect for participation in planning. So all urban planning projects since uh, Law 1997 in Colombia have to have a participatory aspect to that, right? So this is a legal mandate. So what it's been happening though, is that this, this became a sort of like a bureaucratized process in which uh, planners uh, of Bogota have to do this. So they do it, but people are also starting to be fed up with them because they know that many, that many times they go to these meetings, they say a lot of their concerns, the planners go and take notes, but then uh, nothing really happened. And so this in Spanish is called, this word that I really hate, <laughs> it's called socialización, socialization. And here's an example, I brought you an example of a poster of the Bogota uh, Peñalosa's government, how, how this look like, like how they uh, call people to participate, but they call it socialización. So they are socializing the, a project that is gonna happen. And so it's, it's like, we're gonna tell you um, what's gonna happen in your neighborhood. And yes, we want to hear you, like what you think about it, but we're not really involving you in the process. So this became a frustration because there's a lot of, actually there, right, not right now, there's a lot of participatory spaces for planning in Bogota, but many of them have this approach of like planners going and taking notes, but then coming back and then citizens being concerned because they're, their concerns were not taken into account. So um, as this was especially true during the second Peñalosa's term because these partic the participatory planning efforts were uh, really low. And he, because he had this global aura of being this global urbanist that's been recognized for BRT around the world, he sort of like acted as people voted for me in the election. So I'm the mayor, so I'm gonna do the projects that I uh, see uh, more like more correct for the, for the city. So, and you know, this will be sort of the ideas of representative democracy, right? Because you vote for a mayor, then that mayor is allowed to do whatever he wants. Whereas the constitution and the law 388 uh, uh, is promoting a deliberative or participatory democracy, which is that you still have to consult with citizens when you're going to do a, 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 a sort of like a public works or an urban land project. So we see this tension here. And one of the reasons why some citizens now prefer to go to the courts, because they know that by going to the participatory planning meetings, they're not going to be able to change or block or uh, change a fundamental aspect of an urban planning project. So that's, we saw that as a, in a so it came out in many of our interviews, uh, how that was happening. And finally, the, the fourth reason that we saw behind this rise of legal action was how an emerging urban middle class in Bogota has learned how to do these legal mechanisms and is doing, increasingly doing 
those uh, and filing uh, class actions and filing individual rights claims. And so we saw that this we uh, there's a committee uh, that was formed against particularly this the BRT project Transmillennial on the Seventh Avenue by some of the neighborhoods, uh, some of the neighbors in the most affluent part of the project. So the project was going, was really long and was going to, uh, from the south to the north of the city, but, on, but a particular group of neighbors, affected neighbors in one of the most affluent parts of this, the, the place where the BRT was gonna go, were, uh, were very successful in organizing themselves and contracting very uh, good lawyers uh, to then put together demands, right? So there were so there were different demands that were put together by some of these uh, neighbors. So I mean, this is a more complicated story than this. If if you want more details, uh, maybe uh, you can talk to me later. But uh, but the the point here is that we saw we see this dynamic, right? Of like the mid, the emerging middle class uh, frustrated with participatory planning meetings and going to the courts to defend a particular idea of what they think is a good city, right? So this is also because what they think is a good city is not necessarily what, what the middle class, the urban middle class in Colombia think is a good, is a good city or, or what how transport should be planned is not necessarily what poor uh, residents of the city need. So for instance, in some of the protests against BRT, we see a lot of complaints about heritage, architectural heritage that be being demolished or green spaces or environmental pollution, but not so much about issues of equity um, mentioned. There's another thing that we haven't resolved yet, which is this idea is that can we call this nimbism? Because you, this is also a very American concept. First of all, I'm in, in Bogota, people don't have uh, backyards <laughs> normally. So, but we've been sort of like trying to uh, think about this in terms of like, is this nimbism or is this something else? Is this the middle, the emerging urban middle class in Colombia? Uh, what do they want? What is their idea of uh, the good city? So. Anyway, so um, but basically, what we end that uh, article with with proposing an agenda. So based on our the tensions that we saw in our Bogota research, we want to further explore these ideas. So we want other researchers and other students and other planners become interested in in problematizing this because sometimes we see that we this discussion can fall into a very sort of like two sides one, or no? like right sort of like oh because the mayor didn't do participatory planning then citizens were in power and are now going to the courts. And if and we think that this is a much more complicated story. Yeah, yes, there are spaces to democratize and change the way that participatory planning is done in Colombia and in Bogota, which is obviously not work, working well, but it's also not such a romantic story of vulnerable population using the law to then empower themselves. There's also many upper middle classes using also these instruments. So. So basically what we're seeing is a reconfiguration of urban politics and the politics of participation in Bogota through these mechanisms. And so in the article, we talk about particular areas of research that we think that are important to, to, to further explore. Uh, I'm not going to read them, uh, but basically have to do with how do we conceptualize this, this, uh, this phenomenon? So how can, is it a right where to think in terms of judicialization, uh, which puts a lot of emphasis on the role of the courts, the judges and lawyers, or the, or the other term that has been used a lot, which is legal mobilization, but that has put a lot of emphasis on the role of social movements. Uh, but we, as we explained, there's much more actors that are, uh, taking place in this dynamic. Um, how can uh, the mobilization of legal expertise promote newer and deeper forms of participation? How is it changing urban politics and creating the possibilities of new uh, alliances? Who finances and supports this legal action? How is this connected to, uh, to actors, dynamics, and funding sources in the global north or between the global south? Because we see this phenomenon also happening uh, and, and indeed we've drawn from a scholarship from South African and Indian scholars that have been written about this also in recent years. So is this a global South phenomenon? Is this uh, also connected with the North? And how 
And then, then a more maybe hopeful question is like how this legal action can create more inclusive urban spaces and more uh, really the participatory uh, planning mechanisms. Uh, but also finally, uh, another big question for us is the idea of uh, the role of the middle classes in this, the role of nimbism in this, like how can we conceptualize this in a way that it's not just like the traditional maybe story in Latin America about vulnerable populations and elites. There's a growing middle class, emerging middle class in Colombia, and it's, we think it's important also to take that into account. So, um, so that's for the article. So and again, if you're interested, uh, I'm happy. Uh, I mean, you can find it now online, but I'm also happy to write to me and I'll send you a, a PDF. Um, but now I also want to finish this talk by talking about how I want to take these ideas uh, further in the future. And, and so I wanted to share with you some ideas of uh, a book that I'm currently writing uh, in, during my sabbatical, which uh, draws on some, some of the ideas of this article, but also have other data that I've been collecting um, for the last five years since I've been a professor uh, in Bogota. So the book has a tentative title, and this is always tentative, right? Because I've been changing this title almost every day. But for, but for today, it's called Urban Experiments at the Legal Frontier, Planning and the Politics of Participation in Bogota. So again, this is a, pro this is a project in the making, and, uh, and I want to explain you some of the ideas that are behind this so that hopefully you can also help me to try to clarify or try to point at some of the aspects that you find more interesting. So one of the things that I was interested in is this paradox, right? So there's that I've talked a little bit a little bit already. So there's these progressive legal frameworks that were established in Colombia, especially the, the 1991 constitution, but also this law of 1997, they have things such as the social and ecological function of property, the public function of urbanism, the decentralization of planning, and the democratization of planning so that participation became mandatory as we were talking about in urban planning projects. So these are in a way very powerful legal mandates for planning that are now in place by the constitution and this law. And yet we, saw, we see that citizens are constantly frustrated with the lack of participation, but also the lack of redistribu the redistribution goals in urban planning. So, and this is part of this paradox is why citizens are increasingly using uh, legal uh, instruments and legal tools to uh, alter or suspend urban planning projects. So in this context, I see the mobilization of legal expertise, reconfiguring urban politics and becoming an important arena to learn, because there's also a learning curve, an experiment in the ongoing process to democratize but also neoliberalized urban planning in Colombia. And I have this slash there very strategically because that's one of the key tensions that I see behind this uh, mobilization of, of legal action and, and in the idea of participation itself, right? Because um, what we're seeing in Latin America is that even though we have this wave of democratization in the 90s, we also have a, a parallel wave of neoliberalization that happened in the, in the 80s and 90s structural adjustment project uh, programs from the World Bank. So many of these big infrastructure projects or urban planning projects are now done through public-private partnerships, uh, through so the private sector became much more important in, in public works. So we have this mix, right, of more neoliberal logics with also more democratic logics that are constantly in tension. And, uh, and they are intention particularly in the politics of participation and in the politics of, of mobilization of legal expertise. So that's one of the things that I want to take on. Uh, the other thing is another academic debate on the judicialization of urban politics. And so this is mostly done by social legal scholars. And so social legal scholars, scholars in law have been looking a lot at sort of the, the role of contracts, the role of auditing, the role of oversight mechanisms. Uh, and so we can also see, and in a way, and I don't know how many of you are planners in the audience, but um, probably this is also reminiscent of, uh, of the older paradigm of advocacy planning. So the idea of that planners, uh, mostly um, famously espoused by uh, Davidoff. And so how the, who was a lawyer himself, 
Um, so the idea of how planners should be lawyers or, and defending particular clients rather than being just the agents of the state, right? So we so in this politics of where as planning is becoming more and more and more involved with the courts, then it becomes more important to to train planners in the law and then law in the legal details. And I say this because I'm also. I, I put together a master of urban planning at my home university in Bogota. And this is one of the things that we realized we, we are not teaching enough. We're not teaching the future planners how the law works and how uh, it's, it can change and or block. Uh, so you can have the, be the best technical urban planning project, but it can be blocked by a, in, in, by a legal thing. So, so we think that it's important to sort of like put this discussion in uh, more in urban planning, both in academic debates, but also in the pedagogical strategies to teach the future uh, planners. And finally, another uh, academic debate that I find interesting and exciting for this is the idea of, uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, but there's a lot of literature now on, on this idea of experimental approaches to planning, the idea that we need cities to experiment with uh, DIY, with tactical urbanism, with pop-up urbanism, with new ideas that can be uh, implemented in a short period of time so that people can change their, their way of seeing the city. And so there's a lot of uh, literature that has emerged in a lot of urban laboratories that have emerged in recent years to sort of like make people participants of changing the city through small short-term urban interventions. And I think there's a lot of potential in that, but there's also being a lot of critique because these are maybe projects that last, that are very exciting for like, I don't know, two months and, and, and people are able to, I don't know, build housing for, for 10 families or paint um, things in the street so that bicycle feel a bit more, more secure. But in the end, these are experiments that also don't last and don't get institutionalized in the long term. So I've been trying to think about how these, what is going on right now with the law can also be seen as sort of like planning experiments with the law. And so I'm, I'm excited to, to further explore this idea of how in order to uh, have a the outcomes of these uh, urban interventions to be long term, how if we think of this as legal experiments or planning experiments rather than urban interventions, this could be, this could be a more uh, interesting way of thinking about um, this. So these are some of the academic debates that I've been interested in to, to relay with this book project. And these are some of the key terms that, I, that I've been thinking also. So as I said, in this article, we use this idea of mobilizing legal expertise as opposed to other terms that have been used, such as judicialization of politics, or, you, or we, could call, we could have called this the judicialization of urban planning. But we think that judicialization, the concept uh, uh, stress or emphasizes the role of the courts, the role of judges and lawyers. But as we see, there's many different actors doing this. And then there's the other term that's been used a lot in the literature, which is the idea of legal mobilization. But the, if you look at the legal mobilization literature, you will see that a lot of the cases are about social movements. So it's a sort, of, sort of like a more vision about how social movements can change the city through the uses of law. So with, by using this term, we sort of like give, want to give space to the different kind of actors, including politicians, including uh, middle class uh, coalitions, including neighborhood associations that are also using the law. So that's one key term. The other key term is that one that I was just explaining, which I still haven't decided whether it's going to be the idea of urban experiments or planning experiments or legal experiments, but it has to do with this idea of how we move beyond this idea of tactical urbanism to have experiments that are actually lasting in the long term. And then finally, another term that I've been thinking a lot about recently is the idea of legal frontier. So like how all these experiments are happening and this legal frontier that is characterized by this tension between these neoliberal logics and these democratic logics, right? So as opposed to many studies that think about that are blaming gentrification and all the problems of the Latin American cities to neoliberalism, we also have to acknowledge that we have now such a new legal frameworks about democratic possibilities that didn't happen before. So this is not like in the global, when you think in, in, in the political economy of the global North, particularly in the US, 
and Europe, you see, or Northern Europe, you see this idea of like going from a welfare state uh, to like a neoliberal state that does not provide as much as it did before. But in Latin America, we don't have that story. We never had a powerful state that was a welfare state that was providing, and now we have a neoliberal state. Rather, we have a combination of logics of that is both a government that wants to be neoliberal sometimes, but also is uh, being pushed to be more democratic. So this idea of legal frontier for me would be an interesting way of thinking about how these experiments can both uh, advance a neoliberal logic or a, a more democratic logic to planning. So in a way, what, it is, what is, is at stake in these planning experiments with the law is uh, about democratizing or more neoliberalizing uh, urban planning and therefore the outcomes that can come out of that. Um, so, and I don't have time to talk about the cases that I that I would that I'm going to consider for this book project, but some of them I already talked about. Some of them is the BRT project on the Seventh Avenue, but there's much more projects that have been uh, related with this legal action. So the new, the first new metro line that has been uh, contracted recently, but also some of the urban redevelopment plans that are happening in Bogota some uh, policies around public space and local economic development, and, and also some of the projects around regional planning. So all of them have been in somehow or another have been affected by this uh, dynamic and is changing the way that uh, they're functioning. So to conclude and to leave you with some ideas, and then we can open this up for questions. Um, so there's uh, this new progressive legal frameworks introduced in Colombia in the 90s. But three decades later, the results in terms of inclusion and democratization is lacking, right? So we are, people are frustrated uh, with this uh, participation mechanisms. And so what we're seeing is that there's been a learning curve and now politicians, uh, citizens, social movements, uh, different people are going to the courts or are going to use these legal mechanisms uh, in order to try to impose or their view of what the city should be. Now that creates a tension because one would say, well, but shouldn't be the mayor and the planners who were democratically elected, the ones that should be driving this, right? So if Peñalosa, whatever we like him or not, that was his flagship project to build the BRT on the 7th Avenue and was elected to build that, then how is it possible that then a judge is able to block a project where planners have been working for two years. But then citizens will, some of the concerned citizens, especially from this neighborhood, uh, affluent neighborhood affected, will, would celebrate this as, you know, a victory of participation and a victory against the mayor that didn't want to do participatory planning. So anyway, so we see that there's a interesting tension here that it's important for us if we're interested in, in planning and what can planning do um, for a city. And then uh, again, uh, we don't want to call this, or I, I don't want to call this judicialization of urban planning, because then it, that in, would imply that it, it's the judges and lawyers that are the main actors that are now deciding. Because what is happening is that in order for a case to get to the courts, it's actually been a different, different sets of projects and different sets of people that have been pushing and putting together a case in order to get to the courts. So by only looking at the courts, we'll be missing the sort of like urban politics that is behind uh, the, this legal expertise being mobilized. And also the other thing that I didn't have much time to talk about today, but it's also an interesting thing that is happening, is the idea of Vedurias Ciudadanas, which is this uh, audit, citizen audit committees or citizen control committees that are increasing in numbers uh, in Bogota. So it's this idea of like overseeing a project. And so you, you can form citizen committees around that. And you can actually, through those bedrooms, you can also try to block or change projects. But this is not a this is not participatory planning method, but it's more of like when the contract is assigned, then you can create this sort of citizen control audit mechanism. And that that is also, uh, exploding in Bogotá, a lot of citizens, the more and more they learn about how to use them, uh, they are creating more and using this instrument more. So this is also an interesting thing that I would like to explore uh, in this book. So anyway, I think I'm gonna leave it here. I think I'm on time. 
so like because I would like to have your um, comments, questions. Uh, if you know about other places in the world that where these dynamics are also happening, that would also be very helpful, especially if it's in the global south, but also uh, from other places. So thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Sergio. Um, it is so lovely to have somebody come talk to us about the legal foundations and recourse um, and how they impact urban planning. I think this is true around the world. Certainly it resonates extensively with the United States where since the establishment of many of these environmental and social protection laws in the 1970s, we've seen a lot of use of laws both to protect and oppose things like the Dakota pipeline, but then also the use of them to, uh, for as you say, for nimbious reasons by middle and upper classes using the language of environment mm -hmm. or now with climate of nature-based solutions to do what um, lower income groups would say is ethnic cleansing or yeah. uh, vision of inclusive development. So it bears brings to mind that, you know, ultimately perhaps to me, it's not necessarily even about the law, but really about the failures of planning and mobilization to address these things before you mm -hmm. get to the level of the law. Um, and it, it reminds me also of um, Larry Suskind's story of, uh, what story was it? It's like um, Sleeping Beauty and how mm -hmm. they forgot to invite that one fairy godmother and then she cursed them all, right? This is a failure of inclusive party planning that has real consequences. Um, so let me invite questions from the audience online as well as um, here in person. We have about 25 to 30 minutes with Sergio to ask questions. All right, while you're all thinking, let me um, come up with a question here to, to open up for discussion here. Um, I guess the, some of the things that you were debating on La Septima seemed like perhaps um, aspects that technical or perhaps um, social processes could have solved. Like if one of the major concerns was the diesel pollution, there are EV buses that one could imagine. So there are certain ways to get around some of those concerns, but I'm curious whether you think ultimately you know, this is a fundamentally classist discussion of mass popular support for a BRT that will connect workers to this major employment area, but local residents who are wealthy are being able to oppose them. So even if you address some of the technical concerns, can there be any resolution uh, on technical grounds, or is this really a struggle for um, rights to the city or space to the city that cannot easily be, re be resolved? Um, and if there were protests by the local residents, where were the counter protests that would have been supportive? Where was Penelope's base that elected him in support of this project when yeah. these conversations were going on that might have mobilized support um, by the judges to interpret it in a different way? Yeah, thanks. No, that's a that's a great question. And I think it's one of the biggest issues that we've been trying to deal. And we for this research, I've we've interviewed uh, people both on the planning side, but also people that were part of these committees, people that were strongly against uh, the project, people that were strongly in favor. So it's not easy uh, to, um, to, to answer, but I, I would tell you that there are different legal demands, for instance, for this project. So there was not just one. Uh, so there were, diff there were five different, at least five that we've recorded, um, but maybe there were more, but we, this is and this has been part of the difficulty of doing this research is that and in general I think it would it would be interesting to take into account that it's not so there's not such a like a common place where you can go and find oh these were the demands that were filed against this project right no you have to like go through different courts different tribunals and ask people uh, so we for instance in the beginning we thought there were four cases but then we we found out about a fifth one and then now we've discovered a sixth uh, another one so part of this is the idea that these are not this is very sort of like not well recorded and this is going through different courts and so there's not a clear sense of what's going on but i would say that one came from this committee of concerned neighbors from a more sort of like affluent part of the project Another one came from politicians, as I was saying, uh, 
politician, elected politicians are very much interested in this because they want to discredit the current major project. So uh, actually one of the initial demand, uh, legal, uh, legal demands that went through was one uh, famous uh, uh, politician that was really didn't want Peñalosa to be this, but it was mostly, I think, uh, a personal political battle rather than anything to do with the city or with the technical aspects of the project. But then we have a, another that came from architects from a, or led by an architect that was very concerned about how uh, uh, architectural heritage place was gonna be uh, demolished to build the BRT station. Um, so you see, so we have a very different uh, set of actors and that's what we've been trying to understand because I feel like we need to first to understand who is using these mechanisms to then understand the potential of these mechanisms to then uh, democratize or to, pro or to promote a particular vision of the city or a particular right to the city. Because it, inter interestingly, this idea of uh, participation, right to the city is being mobilized by the middle classes as well. And it's not that also, I don't want to demonize the middle classes because you know, that's part of, I mean, I, you know, they live there, they have a, they should have also the right to say what's good or not for them. But then what happened, I guess the, the fundamental question for us was like, what, what is house planning, how planning should change in order for this to not happen or in order for this to be sort of like, instead of going to the judge, to the judges. So there will be sort of like a negotiation before the, the, the planning process is done and not through the participatory planning meetings that we all know that they are not going anywhere because they did some participatory planning. And actually it was interesting. We have an interesting anecdote about how this citizen committee against the project was formed after the local government did a participatory planning meeting in the neighborhood. And basically and a lot of people came and basically the, lead, the planner who was leading the meeting was sort of like, well, this is the project that we're gonna do. And people were like, well, but you know, is this supposed to be like for a place to participate? And she said something like, well, but you elected, the, the mayor was elected. So that's where the participation happened. So I'm just like socializing with you what the project is going to be. So that created such rage in people that were in this meeting that prompted the creation of the committee and that committee then became started to create all these like legal actions uh, in order to stop the project. So, so yes, yeah, so there's something about something that we can do about inclusion, but there are also other things that are out of control, which is, for instance, these like political battles between different poli uh, politicians or different political parties that are also at stake here. Um, I see that there are some hands in Zoom, but I don't know. Yeah, I can go next. Um, yeah, please. Uh, thank you for your talk, Professor Montero. Um, so my question is, um, I was curious to know if, um, you know, the citizen groups or the other groups that are opposing this, if they, you know, have alternatives to the, um, you know, the problems that they're opposing, um, because it's interesting for me to see this because where I come from, we, I've been part of um, these protests and things like that because the government was imposing certain projects, but all the groups, the citizen groups that opposed it, um, you know, tied up with uh, planners and architects to come up with alternatives to the, you know, the problem, like to give solutions. So I'm wondering if these groups, you know, came up with um, alternatives. For example, you said that the architects um, put forth um, concerns of his, uh, historic or conservation measures and things like that. So I'm wondering if they came up with other measures because like BRT seems like a really good like public transportation project, which is what we aim to do. So then I was just curious to know if there are alternatives that they proposed, um, so yeah. No, that, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that it speaks to how how can we imagine then maybe that the participatory process is something that is not just about, you know, consulting people like, do you like this project or not? Or where are your concerns? But thinking of citizens as like, you know, like not knowing anything about planning, you, you know, we are the expert. You just like tell us what, where are your concerns and we will try to figure out. 
what you're asking is a very interesting question. We would change uh, the, the dialogue and the, the power dynamics, which is like thinking that actually people in the audience might be architects, might be experts, might be people that can then ally with other people to actually come up with a proposal. So the, the more similar case to this, and I didn't have time to talk about this today in the talk, but there's another case that is very interesting in Bogota. And this is an urban redevelopment project that is happening in a neighborhood called um, Fenicia. It is near actually around the neighborhood around University of the Andes where I, where I work. And this is an urban redevelopment project that initially was gonna be done in the sort of like bulldozers or like buying people out, displacing residents and then build like high density towers. And so some of the professors of the universities and the students and also the, the sort of like the neighborhoods uh, organized to stop the, because the university was the, also the promoter of the urban redevelopment plan. Uh, and so the neighborhoods organized, but also some people inside the university allied with the neighbors and then were able to change the project and then experiment. And that's what I, the idea of experiment, I think is very interesting to me, experiment a new way of them staying in the neighborhood without using the traditional mechanisms for urban renewal, which is expropriation. Right. So here, what they did was a land, eventually was a land readjustment scheme was, was done so that people put their properties in a common land trust, and then they will get whatever square meters of house of a house they have now in the new developments. So, and also this, so this was a very interesting because it was the, one of the first times it, it happened in Colombia. And that's what I mean by the idea of or how do you do experimenting with a lot? Because that what they did, the neighbors, was to hire their own expert in urban planning, their own an, an architect. And so they went not to the meetings to say, oh, I think that this and that, or I'm concerned about that, but rather they were making claims through the, these legal mandates, right? And proposing changes. So that is real, like an, it's a different way of doing participatory planning, right? Because it's not just the planner that is like leading the whole process. It's, uh, it's the it's citizen, concerned citizens with a different planning expert and having a conflict with uh, or a discussion with the official planner. So, so in, in that way, proposing things. So I think that is a very interesting thing. That's one of the things that I want to write in this book because I feel it's a very interesting case that can give us some hints about how to rethink uh, the way in which we involve citizens in planning. Thank you. And I see Hantao has his hand. Uh, I think Paula is, um, is to be first speaking, so I'm going to wait for her answering okay. the question. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, nice to meet you, Sergio. My name is Paula. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm from Bogota, so great. I'm really glad that you mentioned the Phoenicia case because I was actually going to ask you something uh, related to the experts because in the in your paper you mentioned that both the DRT DRT uh, opposing groups from the Septima were using experts, but also the uh, Mesa de los Cerros group. They use like a different type of expert. Uh, they use like uh, the legal clinics are also housing universities. So I was thinking maybe because I know that I'm familiar with the case from Venetia and how the architecture school was like on one side <laughs> with the university mm -hmm. and more like the history side and sociology were working with the residents. Mm -hmm. so about like the different type of experts that are related in both groups. That was like my first question. And the mm -hmm. second if I can ask the second one, is that um, I don't know if you're thinking about any type of networks that are happening between these groups. Mm -hmm. you know, against the Tetima and also against the animal in the 68 Avenue. And maybe if these, they're using the same or like similar methodologies, and especially if they're like within the socioeconomic uh, class that you talk about. Because I know that 
neighborhoods that are close to each other. They do share resources uh, and they use the same kind of like format for the legal actions, but I don't know if that's happening also across socioeconomic barriers. Thank you. Great, great questions. This is very important uh, things that I've also been considering. So one, the first question, which is about what kind of experts were involved in the case in this, in particular in the Phoenicia urban redevelopment case. Um, so yes, this is interesting because for instance, the university, uh, so what um, uh, she was talking about, uh, I forgot your name, sorry, uh, Lara or Paula? Yeah, so Paula was talking about uh, a, a sort of like a divide within the university where like the architecture department were sort of like more friendly towards the idea of the, the you know, putting together workshops and design thinking stuff, not like what the kind of thing the architects likes to do. Um, but, but yet other people uh, more maybe coming from the social sciences were more concerned about the redistribution issues uh, that this project would bring would bring, bring about to the neighborhood. But what I'm, and when I'm talking that the neighbors, that the neighbors from Phoenicia hire their own expert, it's not an expert from the university, obviously, because they thought that the university was involved in this project. So they didn't, they didn't want the university to represent themselves, which was the, what the university was trying to do in the beginning, right? Oh, no, we'll put our expertise to your hands so you can, you know. But then they were like, well, the, you are the promoter of this plan. So like, we need to have our own experts. So they hire, is it was an architect, but it was an architect that was ex, an expert in legal issues, right? So a lot of what the neighbors did with this architect that they hired themselves and they pay for themselves, what the kind of expertise was actually legal expertise. Uh, and it was about like reclaiming the project, both the university and the city, uh, their rights to remain in terms of legal uh, issues. So that was a very interesting, so about how uh, this became an architect in a way that actually was able to mobilize legal knowledge to sort of like have a conversation with the planners of the city uh, in a sort of like a more horizontal way. So that's what they, the neighbors were able to allow by hiring their own expert, right? So that is a very interesting story. Actually, that's something that I am planning to write because I think it's, it's, uh, it will be illuminating for many of these issues. Then the second question, which is the idea of the networks. Yes, we, uh, in, while, while I was doing this research, uh, we have observed this also, like especially how this committee from the Septima against BRT, they learn from other cases. So they learn from the case of the Cerros de Bogota, which is another sort of another case that I didn't have time to talk about today, but um, but uh, it's, another, it's another case of citizens using legal action to demand the state to change something around planning. And this was a very successful case that had been on a legal struggle for a long time. And some of the things that they learn in, in this struggle were then transferred to other conflicts in Bogota. So the case around Reserva de la Vanderhamen where also some of the people learn from the Cerros and the, the people from the Septima also. So yes, there is this sort of like educated middle-class people on the left that have been sharing uh, ideas and sharing legal strategies to oppose particular projects that they see, particular Peñalosa projects that they see that are against uh, either uh, their interests or the environment. Uh, but yes, so it's, there is a network of people that have been diffusing. And, I, and as I said in the presentation, this is a learning curve, right? So, so what I think it's interesting is that we're just seeing the beginning of this, but I think this is become, it's gonna become more and more important because more people now know how to do this and they can, and they can see how this can really block projects in a way that they cannot do it in, in other ways. Um, so um, Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask my question? Um, so, hi, um, thanks for your presentation. I have one question regarding your presentation and one little comment. So the question is, I want to push back a little bit of 
previously what Professor Shai just said. I mean, the case of Bogota surely shows us that when participatory planning is not enough, the local resistance would emerge to de somehow denounce the planning at all. But the dimension of politics basically reminds us that the mm -hmm. government is not naturally wrong and the local, local locality is not naturally good, right? So what strikes me in your case is how it's uh, how a company can so easily hire a, a, a single lawyer and hold a plan that is developed and somehow authorized by thousands of people before. So it, it instead remind, brings me to wonder, like when we talk about participatory planning, what is the exact extent of participation to make us think that the city has, to, has done enough to be considered as good participation? Do you think like, in, in our society, there is a, a, a asymmetry of the political system somehow making urban planning increasingly impossible to be implemented, whereas it is so much easier for community to say no to a plan and mm -hmm. hold a plan at all than the society saying yes to a plan and actually implementing a potentially good plan to the society at all. Yes, no, that is the $1 million. <laughs> question and I think that um, yes and when and then we when when one looks at the U.S. actually and the impossibility of building infrastructure in that country uh, you know like you want to see like the for instance the efforts around building high-speed train in California or actually the example of the that I was talking in the beginning of of, of, the, of the presentation of the Van Ness BRT in San Francisco Oh my God, that VRT in San Francisco took 20 years to be built. In Bogota, it was built the, in the beginning, the, the, the first that Peñalosa did in the beginning was built in three years or two years, no? So one would say, so why do we want participation if it's just gonna block, uh, continually block projects? So, and I think that is the $1 million question because I also don't think this top-down exercises are good either. <laughs> so then one would say, yes, can we strike a balance somewhere in the middle? Yes, that would be ideal. But then you get to this moment in which, where is this middle point? Where is this middle point? And I guess that is the, at the core of your question. Like when is participation enough? Like when can, where, when can we say that we did a project that is not just a top-down approach that we did involve people but that we are not involving everyone because in an 88 million people city, we can't not ask 8 million people to participate in every single urban planning project, right? So where is enough? And that is, I don't know, that is a, that is a very interesting question. And I, and I think that is a question that planning <laughs> is dealing with, not just in Bogota, but in general. But I think that we need to find that middle, that middle point in where ex technical expertise uh, do not dominate, but also we're not like prisoners of participation, right? Because there's always going to be people opposing something. Um, and so I think that there's some, some approaches in planning that I've been reading actually recently, which is this idea of agon, uh, the idea of agonism, right? So the idea of recognizing that there are different interests in the city and that these interests are gonna clash and that what pe when people complain, this is, a, this is another typical thing, right? So like, for instance, the community. Oh, the community said that they oppose the project, right? But who's the community? The community is a particular group of citizens that organize at a particular moment of time to reclaim a project. But that doesn't mean that, that there's other community members that are not organized and maybe they, they are in favor of the project. So, so like the, these ideas of agonistic urban planning to me has been interesting to read lately of like how to recognize that there's not just the state and the community so this will be sort of like the traditional way of thinking, but rather that there are different communities with different interests and that the planner has to somehow find a way to sort of visualize those conflicts. So not just about, because sometimes also planners try to not, you know, visualize conflicts because, you know, they're, they, they, they think that their role is to bring consensus. So like, how do we, in, how do we understand communities in plural as having different interests and then 
being able to sort of like make those communities uh, talk about those conflicts and then at some point stop and make a, you know, a decision that can be both informed by technical issues, but also informed by these conflicts and achieving something that it would probably not be the perfect um, solution, neither technically nor politically, but something that somehow uh, reflects both sides. I, I know it's a broad question, but thanks for trying to <laughs> answering that. And since my since the time is constrained, so I will just uh, put my comment on the chat box in case you want to take a look. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Penny. I know we just have a couple of minutes left, but uh, my question actually follows really well with the conversation um, that we're just having. Um, my question is about so clearly the middle class has dominated this legal arena in which um, they've been participating in blocking the planning project. And do you have concern that in democratizing the process that since they also have the most experience with get, being engaged with social organizing and social movement, that it's going to move the, the process from taking place in the courts to the middle class continuing to dominate the conversation when it's happening in participatory planning. And um, how are you considering how tools and mechanisms might be able to uh, mobilize those people who are of lower social economic status who would benefit more from social good projects? And kind of on a side to this, has there been thought about how to mobilize legal action in support of those particular populations um, in, in the ways that this is currently taking place in the courthouses? Yeah, no, perfect. Yeah, it does follow on this conversation. And I think that it is important to also recognize that the vulnerable populations in Bogota or Colombia have used legal strategies for a long time, right? So that we have these battles in the 60s and 70s to regularize land for informal housing, to le legalize informal housing uh, through, uh, through a legal instrument, which is to get property titles, right? So it's not that vulnerable populations or poor populations have not used the law. Actually, they've used the law and they have also used it in a very informal way, right? So they've used it in way of like networks through council members to like get property titles on particular plots of land. So we have a politics of use of legalizing land that is in Bogota, but in Latin America in general, and probably in many other countries in the global south, is dates back from, from all these battles around informal housing in the 60s and 70s. So the, the people, activists and social movements from representing poor areas of the city or activist leaders in these areas know how to, they've known how to use legal instruments for a while. So what we have now is, and, but then I think one of the key issues here is how to define the middle class, right? Because especially in countries like Colombia or La Latin America, where there's such, there's always been traditionally such a distance between vulnerable populations and rich people, like really rich or elite people. But what we're seeing, I think in the in recent decades is the emerging of a middle class, a middle class. And by middle class, I don't mean upper middle class or at least not just upper middle class. I also mean middle classes in the way of like people that have the, for the first time, access uh, a house, a formal house, or people that are aspiring to have a middle-class lifestyle. And these are people and that are also uh, trying to uh, think what is their role in the, in the city? What is their, and they want to have their vision of the city or what the city should be in planning. So, so I think the interesting thing about talking about the middle-class, and I, and I agree that, or I would say that still, I would probably need a better sense of what the middle class is because there are different kinds of middle class is to sort of like think about that politics and urban politics in Colombia cannot be thought just in terms of two sides like vulnerable population and middle class really meaning elites no I don't mean middle class meaning upper middle class I really I really mean middle class as something in between the poor and and the elites that have normally dominated planning also, no? So anyway, so because I feel like a lot of time we use middle classes as a way to say, oh, the rich people in the city or the people that can make decisions in the city, but really the people that make, that have traditionally made 
important decisions about the city in Latin America, at least, have been the elites, which is not middle class, right? So anyway, so that, that's an interesting question, which I think the short answer is that we definitely need to understand better these emerging middle classes uh, and what is that? What is their vision of the city? All right, well, that brings us to our conclusion. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk and all the things that you're making us uh, much more cognizant of, including a focus on the middle class. I think in our uh, program, I think we certainly have that dichotomous division between low income groups and uh, wealthy elites. And you're right to point out the concerns of a middle class, of the vast majority of city spaces that are neither the downtown centers nor these uh, favelas or the slums, but actually middle class suburbs, for instance, um, and their residential housing and, and those concerns. So um, really appreciate all of the insights that you've shared from afar in Toronto. Please join me in giving Sergio a warm thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure to be here and thank you for the comments and the questions that were really good and it helped me in this process that I am right now of thinking about how to think about this dynamic. So thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.